Good evening. It's a beautiful night tonight, isn't it? Yeah. I'm Lena Moore, and I serve as the Deputy Executive Director here at the Clinton Foundation. And it is my honor to welcome you all on behalf of our wonderful volunteers and our staff at the Clinton Foundation to the Clinton Presidential Center. Welcome. We are thrilled you are here to join us tonight as we explore the surprising global legacy of Anne Frank. As many of you know, Anne Frank holds a special place here at the Clinton Presidential Center. Uh, we were one of 11 entities to receive a sapling from the actual tree that stood outside her secret annex when she and her family were hiding. We got that and we're so proud. In 2015, we opened our newest permanent exhibit and if you've seen it, you, you've noticed that they have, we have the glass panels. And the glass panels are positioned in a way to give you a feeling of sitting in a room, as they did. And the glasses are etched um, with a quote from Anne Frank, a quote from President Clinton. But the glass also, they convey the complex history of the human rights here in Arkansas which with descriptions of the Indian Removal Act in 1830 and the internment of the Japanese Americans during World War II, as well as the Little Rock Central High desegregation crisis. So we're really proud of that. And so thank you for helping us to come and celebrate Anne Frank and her legacy, as well as our exhibit. When President Clinton spoke at the exhibit dedication, he said, young people should be able to go to places like this and see symbols of life, unity, and hope. And we will remember the wisdom of a 14-year-old girl whose spirit is depending on us to redeem the years she didn't have. Those are some powerful words with a poignant meaning. Her message does need to be heard, and it needs to be heard often. It's why we are so committed to having programs just like these, which share her legacy of tolerance, of peace, and justice. And we have several donors here tonight who purchased pavers. Um, I'd love for you to stand. I want to thank you in person for doing that. Um, there are people who had pavers purchased for them as well to honor you. And we have Clinton Presidential Center members here tonight. Thank you all for all of your support, it's because of you we're able to continue this work, which is so important. It's important to us to be able to share Anne's story because we know that her words can inspire, we know that they can heal, and we know that they can change hearts. So thank you all uh, for everything you've done for us. Now, it's my honor to introduce tonight's guest. We have Jillian Perry. She is the co-founder of the Anne Frank Trust UK, a partner organization of the world famous Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. Her book, The Legacy of Anne Frank, was published in 2018. The book explores the influence Anne Frank's life has had on young people in countries all over the world, helping to shape their moral framework and giving them critical life skills. So please, please, please help me thank and welcome Jillian Perry to the stage. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Right. Let me just get this one. Good. Okay. So, today I visited your Anne Frank tree, and um, it was wonderful to see, and to see the quote from Anne, and to see the quote from President Clinton, and to look at some of your paving stones, your pavers. So, thank you for those. You know, it wasn't easy to get a glimpse of the outside world and the tree when Anne Frank was in hiding for two years, in a set of rooms tucked away above and behind her father's offices and warehouse in Amsterdam. It wasn't easy. When she did, it involved climbing up 
a rickety, rickety ladder up to the attic above the rooms. And there was a small and high window. And it wasn't overlooked, so it wasn't covered. So Anne could actually look out and see the tree her link to the outside world. Often her visits to that dusty attic were in the company of Peter Van Pels, who those of you who've read the diary will know that he was the other, the teenage boy whose family were also in hiding with the Frank family. And he was the boy that she fell in love with, described vividly in her diary. She fell in love with him at age 14 as her body was changing, her emotions were changing from a girl, child, into an adolescent. Then she fell out of love with him. She felt herself maturing faster than he did. Now, as Anne looked out at the tree, she felt invigorated by a connection, a reconnection with the outside world that she'd left behind in July 1942, when the family had to flee into hiding very suddenly after a call-up notice for Anne's older sister, Margot, who turned 16. Now, Anne wrote several times in her diary about that tree and indeed about her great love of nature. Now, an example of this, um, was during the excitement of her falling in love with Peter. And on the 7th of March, 1944, she wrote, I lie in bed at night after ending my prayers, and I'm filled with joy. At such moments, I don't think about all the misery, but about the beauty that still remains. This is where mother and I differ greatly. Her advice in the face of melancholy is, Think about all the suffering in the world and be thankful you're not part of it. My advice is, go outside to the country. Enjoy the sun and all nature has to offer. Go outside and try to recapture the happiness. Thank you, God, for all that is good and dear and beautiful within yourself. Think of all the beauty in yourself and in everything around you, and be happy. I don't think mother's advice can be right, because what are you supposed to do if you become part of the suffering? You'd be completely lost. On the contrary, beauty remains. Even in misfortune, if you just look for it, you discover more and more happiness and regain your balance. A person who's happy will make others happy. A person who has courage and faith will never die in misery. Now she wrote those words when she'd been in hiding for nearly two years. And every day when she woke up, she was in fear that the family would be betrayed and arrested. And of course, eventually that's what happened. And we don't know if Anne thought of her words when she lay on the floor of Bergen-Belsen camp in her final days of suffering. It's pretty unlikely. For ultimately, although Anne had hope, she had great hope that's exemplified in what she wrote in her diary, hers was not a story with a happy ending. But her story did become one of hope and that was through her father, Otto Frank, who, despite experiencing the most brutal side of humanity and the loss of all his immediate family, still believed in the power of education. So, there's the hiding place. There's our Anne. And there's Otto Frank. Now, this is Otto Frank as a young man. He was a seventh generation Frankfurt Jew and a proud German. He came from a comfortable family whose father didn't just work in a bank, he owned a bank, the Michael Frank Investment Bank. Otto fought patriotically in World War 
one for his home country, Germany. And so much so that at the end of the war, he received the Iron Cross for valor. A country that just 20 years later was to describe him and his family as subhuman, untermenschen, not worthy of the right to live. Now, Otto Frank is the reason that I'm standing here with you today and why you know the name Anne Frank. As the only one of the eight people that were in hiding together in Amsterdam, he was the only one to survive the brutality of the Holocaust. Otto fought against all odds to have his daughter's diary published. And that wasn't an easy task in post-war Amsterdam, where people had suffered so much themselves during the war. And actually, paper rationing was still in force, um, presenting further obstacles to getting the diary published. But once it was published in 1947, he spent the rest of his life promoting his daughter's diary as a force for good. He once explained, as an older man, Anne's diary was a great help to me in retaining a positive attitude and an outlook on the world. With its publication, I hope to help many people, and that proved to be the case. Indeed, it did. But actually now, let's go back to Anne. And I'm going to lead into my first reading from the book, which I hope is going to bring her feisty character to life for you. Now, in May 1940, the Nazis had invaded the Netherlands, where the Frank family had fled in 1933. In, in February 1942, the German occupiers issued an edict that all Dutch Jewish boys, girls, men, women, between the ages of 16 and 40, were to report to be sent away to work camps in Germany. Now, work camp was actually a euphemism. In fact, these, were, these kids were going to be worked to death, and very few of those that reported were ever returned. Now, Margot turned 16 in February of that year, just after the edict. So Otto started panicking, and he started making frantic plans to take his family into hiding above his offices on the Prinzengracht in Amsterdam. By the way, have any of you in the audience visited the Anne Frank House? Wow, that, considering how far away we are, that is a really good, good number. Wow, absolutely. So, with members of his trusted members of his staff, he started preparing a set of rooms above and behind the offices and warehouse. And this was done very secretly at night, just in case they would have to suddenly flee into hiding. Otto had actually tried for several years to actually get his family out to America. And even though he was very friendly with the influential Strauss family of New York, uh, Nathan Strauss Jr. was actually a friend that he met in university, and he came to do a work placement in New York for Nathan Strauss's family, who owned a certain rather famous department store in New York. Anyone, any ideas which department store it is? It was Macy's, absolutely. Yeah, so Otto actually came and worked um, in the early, very early years of the 20th century, came and worked for Macy's. And he loved it. He loved New York. He loved the brashness of it. He loved all the skyscrapers and you know, the fact that here was the new world. But actually, his father died very suddenly. And so he was called back to Frankfurt to run the family bank and then, of course, the First World War. But he did try during the 1930s to get his family out of um, Germany first. And then that was not successful. And then when the... Um, uh, the, the, the Germans occupied the Netherlands. He also tried to get his family out of the Netherlands, but to no effect. It, no one would take them. So there he was. He's setting up this set of rooms. And can you imagine, he's bringing furniture. He and his staff are bringing furniture up those very steep stairs, if you remember. 
And um, because they couldn't use the hoists, the external hoists, hoists of the buildings, because um, they, it, it, you couldn't let people know that you were preparing a hiding place. So it's incredible that they actually did this. So he's getting the uh, hiding place ready just in case. And meanwhile, on the 12th of June, 1942, Anne, his second daughter, turns 13. And a few days before her 13th birthday, Otto and Anne are walking near the, um, their apartment where they lived on the place called the Moveda Plain. And there was a big bookshop. That bookshop is, by the way, is still there. It's different, different ownership, but it's still there, that bookshop. And she spots this little red check notebook in the window. And um, I'm sure the reason that she was so interested in it was, uh, can you see that there's a lock on the front, and what 13-year-old girl doesn't want a lock on a no notebook to prepare secret notes? And so she drops a few hints to her father, you know, like kids now when it's coming up to Christmas or it's coming up to their birthday, Dad, I want the latest Nike trainers or the latest Xbox. And so she dropped this hint, and sure enough, Otto Frank, being a loving father, went back and got um, the diary. So, I'm going to um, start my first reading. Anne receives her diary as a surprise for her 13th birthday. Anne started writing in her notebook on the day she received it. Her first words were, I hope I'll be able to confide everything in you as I've never been able to confide in anyone. And I hope you'll be a great source of comfort and support. She had no idea on that day that in three weeks' time, the diary was about to indeed become a vital source of comfort and support. She goes on to describe her birthday party and all the gifts she received, and over the next few days, she starts writing and shares her privately held views about her school friends. On this matter, she doesn't hold back, using adjectives such as stuck up, sneaky, and vulgar for some of her unfortunate targets. By the 20th of June, Anne has given her new paper confidant the name Kitty, after one of the characters created by her favorite author. Kitty is to become her friend, a surprising confession from a girl who says she has about 30 friends and a throng of boy admirers who can't keep their eyes off me. But with her human friends, she feels the talk is superficial and about ordinary, everyday things. Kitty will be her true friend. Paper will be her intimate confidant. And anyway, no one is ever going to read it. Three weeks after Anne started her diary, on the afternoon of Sunday, the 5th of July, the doorbell on the Frank family's apartment unexpectedly rang. It was a postman delivering the dreaded notice for 16-year-old Margot to report at midnight for transportation to a work camp. According to the notice, Margot would be permitted to take a number of specified items in a single suitcase, which had to have first and last name, date of birth, and the word Holland written on it, in a foreboding of the true fate of the deportees. It, this was explained to be important because the owner's suitcase would be sent by a separate train. The hindsight of history gives us a grim insight into these bureaucratic instructions. By this time, not only Auschwitz, but Belgets and Chelmno concentration camps were fully operational in carrying out the extermination of Jews. The very next day, on the morning of the 6th of July, 19, 6th of July, 1942, Otto, Edith, and Anne left their Moveda Plain home together and trudged in the pouring rain across the city to the Prinzengracht offices of Opecta, Mr. Frank's company. They were each wearing several layers of clothing and carrying one satchel plus another bag laden with essential items. The city was still dark, and people were scuttling about to get out of the downpour. 
So no one would have taken much notice of the sodden group of people who were leaving their home forever. Having escorted Margot, Meep Heese, Otto's uh, administrator, had already arrived by bicycle at the Prinzengracht office to help with the moving in. To reach the stairs to the hiding place involved slipping through a door that had been carefully concealed by a strategically placed bookcase. The bookcase had been filled with the normal office paraphernalia of document folders so as not to arouse any suspicions from Mr. Frank's office workers. Even to this day, all visitors to Anne Frank's hiding place access it by stepping behind this bookcase. So, Otto Frank um, went on to open the Anne Frank House to the public in 1960. But his vision was not as a memorial to the past, but as an education center, very much like this education center that we're, stand we're in now. He held international student conferences and some of the first students that he invited to come to these conferences in 1960, only 15 years after he'd been liberated from Auschwitz, were actually German students. He was determined that education starts with young people. And as a seventh generation German Jew, he still believed that in the future of Germany and the future of German youth even despite, despite what happened to him. Otto's determination resulted in Anne's diary being translated into over 70 languages and over 30 million copies being sold. And actually, that is Otto Frank standing in the attic that I talked about previously, where Anne and Peter had escaped and were able to look out over the tree on the very morning of the opening of the Anne Frank House. And you can only imagine what he must have been thinking about those that had been lost in that very place. Can you imagine? First visitors to Anne Frank's house all those years ago had to actually ring the doorbell. And people would come and let them in. But um, by the mid-1980s, Already, about 25 years after the opening of its doors, the lines of people going, waiting patiently to get in to visit the secret hiding place were getting longer and longer. And one day, one of the staff of the Anne Frank house actually was sort of looking at the lines of people waiting. He suddenly had an idea. And he went to the director and he said, what if we created a mobile touring Anne Frank House and took it out to the world, the people that wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to come and visit. And the director thought, well, yeah, maybe there's some legs in that. And so he commissioned um, a couple of the historians to uh, create a, an exhibition. And it's this exhibition which really took a life of its own that I'm going to really talk to you about, about it taking it out to the world and this phenomenal legacy. So I'm going to sort of take you on a swift helicopter tour of the world over the past 30 years of the touring exhibition. And it's a period that actually starts almost simultaneously with the presidency of William Jefferson Clinton. So I'm going to talk about three decades of world history and all those seismic changes that we've seen, and, but it's going to be through the prism of Anne Frank. So we start in 1984, and the director of the Anne Frank House commissions the creation of this exhibition, and this is what it looks like. It's a black and white picture, but actually it was a very monochrome exhibition. It was very black and white. It was very big. It was designed by Dutch people. And the Dutch people are actually, apparently, the tallest people in the world. So you can imagine, it was a big exhibit. It took quite a few days to set up. 
And I first got involved with it in 1989. And I have to tell you that to read some of the captions at the top and to see some of the photographs, I used to have to stand like that. Um, and it looks a bit of a dinosaur nowadays. And it, 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 it was, but it was wonderful. Um, I mean, it was, it was big aluminium frames, and it was black and white photographs and on, printed on these sort of white PVC shower curtains. And of course, exhibition design has come on so much in those, in those intervening years. But it really did an amazing job. And um, it was launched in Amsterdam, opened by Queen Beatrix in the Vesterkirk, which is the church right around the corner from the uh, Anne Frank house, and the church that Anne could hear the, the, the chiming of the bells, which was like another link to the outside world, so most appropriate place. And, um, and also simultaneously in Frankfurt, which was the Frank's home city, and also in New York. And um, so it started touring. And one of the very first places that it went to was Moscow. Now, it went to Moscow in most interesting times, 1990. And it was just during that great change of the breakup of the Soviet Union. And this exhibition on Anne Frank, I'm sorry, we didn't have digital photographs in those days. It wasn't easy to access the photos. Um, so it was a time of great change. And so this exhibition comes to Moscow. And you imagine the people that come to see it, they see for the first time an exhibition on the Holocaust. Now, for 45 years, between 1945 and 1990, you didn't really speak about the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. You talked about the suffering of the Soviets during World War II, but not about the, the actual Holocaust. And then it went off to um, uh, Ukraine. And there, people actually came to the exhibition that had survived shooting parties in Ukraine and were able at this exhibition, an exhibition about a girl from the West, to talk about their own experiences for the first time. So you can imagine it was such an important time. And my colleagues who actually went there, uh, I was actually invited to go to this launch in Moscow, but I was met with a firm niet when I actually got to the airport to go. Um, because I'd been a bit of a human rights activist in the 1980s, and apparently my name was still on the computer systems of the Soviets, even though they'd changed over, um, and I wasn't allowed to go. But my colleagues that did go, um, they said that people were so excited, because if this exhibition could come to them from the West, maybe, just maybe one day, they would be able to go and visit the West. So it gave them an incredible feeling of hope for the future. So it was an incredible time to be going to um, Moscow and then Ukraine. And since then, it's been touring and touring and touring, or virtually all the former Soviet countries, the, the Baltic states that were um, in those early days when they left the Soviet Union behind, they were, um, there was a new form of nationalism, not always uh, particularly nice. Um, forming in those states, and Hungary, and Poland. And one of the most recent places um, is that the former Soviet state, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, the country of Genghis Khan. And you think, well, what on earth, how do they relate to a girl from Western Europe in the Holocaust? But you see there this girl who is actually she is telling the story, and this is the other premise of the book, the power of peer education in telling this story. Peer education, teenagers teaching teenagers about this story, even in places as remote as Kazakhstan, how important, you can see how engaged the kids are. And over the last 15, 20 years, the Anne Frank House, where they've taken the exhibition, have been training the youth themselves. And uh, we, have, we adopted it in about 12 years ago in the UK, taking exhibitions into schools and training the teenagers themselves to be the educators. And often in schools of underserved areas where um, the, the kids have very low aspiration, very low ambition. And so it's a really exciting leadership program, program for them. Um, I was just been talking to 
uh, Nancy, the head teacher of the uh, Central High School, which I visited today, uh, the possibility of bringing, uh, bringing one of these programs there. And she said, yes, let's do it. So, um, and so a lot of uh, what I write about is the power of young people teaching young people, this method of, of teaching sensitive, um, sensitive history and how powerful it can really be, especially with Anne Frank, because she was a teenager herself, just like them. So, um, so Kazakhstan, but now I'm going to take you to a completely different part of the world, and also in the early 90s. I'm going to take you across to South Africa, and the Anne Frank exhibition actually was, uh, it was arranged for the Anne Frank exhibition to come and tour South Africa, but uh, it happened by sheer coincidence to coincide with the time, around the time of Nelson Mandela's inauguration. And Mr. Mandela came and opened the Anne Frank exhibition in Johannesburg in August 1994. And so I'm going to take you to the opening of the exhibition in, of the Anne Frank exhibition in Johannesburg in August 94. And uh, so imagine all the great and the good are assembled in uh, Johannesburg to see Mr. Mandela. Let me find the right page. Here we go. Just four months after becoming president of the country, that had imprisoned him for 27 years, Nelson Mandela opened the Anne Frank exhibition at the Museum Africa in Johannesburg. To the surprise and fascination of the audience, Mr. Mandela explained that he'd read the diary of Anne Frank while incarcerated on Robin Island for 18 of the 27 years of his actual imprisonment. It kept our spirits high and reinforced our confidence in the invincibility of the cause of freedom and justice. He said that he'd first read Anne Frank's diary even before he went into prison, but felt that what he derived from books he'd read before his incarceration was totally different from what he received from the same book read while in prison. In the 1960s, while on Robben Island prison, Mr. Mandela had set up what he's described in his autobiography as the Robin Island University, a learning forum for the prisoners to be well equipped to continue the struggle for democracy on their long awaited release. A group of political prisoners confined for decades in the harshest of conditions built a center of learning, not of bricks and mortar, but of intellectual debate. Spearheaded by Nelson Mandela, the university allowed prisoners to lecture on their respective areas of expertise and debate wide-ranging topics including homosexuality and Marxism. In a barren limestone quarry on a secluded island, lectures and animated discussions were carried out during the short periods of rest despite the attentions of the warders who guarded the imprisoned men and oversaw their long days of laboring in the quarry. The lectures and debates took place in snake-infested caves around the quarry during the men's brief respite from breaking stones to take food and shade. One of the books they read and discussed had been Anne Frank's Diary of a Young Girl. It had somehow found its way into the collection of books in the small prison library. Mandela had encouraged the prisoners to read her teenage writing as a testament to the strength of the human spirit. After several years, the little paperback book had been passed around and thumbed so much that its pages fell out and it became an incoherent and incomplete collection of papers. But the prisoners, avid for the message of hope for a better future that Anne envisioned, took turns to clandestinely copy out the pages by hand and collate them back together so that the younger prisoners could continue to draw strength from Anne's words. This was a dangerous act. 
performed secretly by candlelight in the various cells at night. What happened to this volume, we don't know. But it's one of the most remarkable examples of the place in history of Anne's diary. Now, a legacy of the tour of the exhibition of South Africa at that very um, important time was that a few years later, the people that had organized the tour of the exhibition there opened the first ever Holocaust Museum on the continent of Africa. It opened in Cape Town, and it now has also branches in Johannesburg and in Durban. But also the Anne Frank House also continued their work um, by taking exhibitions into the townships. And there we are, that's um, Orlando West Township, uh, just outside Johannesburg. Uh, the townships were very, very difficult um, shanty areas where people live in great, great poverty even to this day. And so I'm going to describe to you um, the guy in the, on the right, the tallest guy on the, in the group on the right, he is the educator from um, the Anne Frank House. He had great links with South Africa because his great-grandfather lived in Durban and was a friend of Mahatma Gandhi, who spent the early part of the 20th century living in Durban. And those are some of the kids that were trained to be Anne Frank peer educators, actually, in Orlando West Township. Now, this is the situation that um, Aaron, the educator from the Anne Frank House, found. Aaron recalled one particular township school they visited. The teachers were mostly drunk, and the children sold their school books to buy cheap drugs. One drug they used was called Tuk. It was made from a cocktail of rat poison, bleach, and HIV medicine, all of which the kids could acquire for free. In that place, 13-year-olds looked like 50-year-olds. Even the police considered it a no-go area. The schools themselves looked like derelict fortresses, fortresses with rusty barbed wire and broken windows. The deprivation was such that Aaron found 17-year-olds sucking their thumbs. He found that this was the way to help stave off hunger pains felt during the day. Aaron summed up what he felt the impact of the Anne Frank work in those places had been. Every time I take a workshop, I'm more inspired and satisfied. I see multipliers who will become instruments of change in their own society, especially in the third world, where being an Anne Frank guide can really change your life. In Europe, kids have the chances and opportunities to become critical thinkers. But in the third world, it's a battle for survival every day. Now, one of the boys in this group, uh, his name was Mekintemba, um, he subsequently wrote about what it had meant to him to be a guide at the Anne Frank exhibition there. And he wrote it for a writing competition that was sponsored by the US Embassy. And he was one of two South African winners that were actually sent to Washington DC as a prize to meet other youngsters. Mekintemba has become a great success story. He's now at university and politically active, and still insisting that his work as an Anne Frank exhibition peer guide has set his life on the right road. So, um, I'm going to move on to another part of the world, and this is Brazil. And this is Sao Paulo. And um, I was actually there. I'm actually just behind the man uh, on the right. You can't see me. He's a bit taller than me. He's Dutch. So <laughs> now these are, these are educators. These are peer educators. And their age between um, 10 and 11. Now, these kids were so enthusiastic. And again, we're in a shanty. We're in a school on a favela which is like the Brazilian equivalent of a shanty town uh, in a township in South Africa. A very polarized society. This is Sao Paulo. 
And um, I was asked to go by the Anne Frank House to open the exhibition. Now, the man in the red tie just so happens to be the Dutch foreign minister who is on a state visit to uh, Brazil, and he's invited to come and open the Anne Frank exhibit in Sao Paulo. Now, you can see that he's looking at the panels very interestedly, and you can see how enthusiastic these little guides are in explaining to the Dutch foreign minister, no less, the situation in Europe after the First World War. And it was the sweetest thing to actually, it, they didn't, it didn't worry them that this man happened to be the Dutch foreign minister. They were still so enthusiastic with their work of telling the story of Anne Frank and the situation in Europe. And you can just see from the picture how enthusiastic they are. Now, Brazil, the work has continued um, with the creation of Anne Frank pioneers. Um, we have um, an organization that we hooked up in, with in Brazil. And um, they are doing remarkable things with young people. So um, I just want to read a little bit to you about what's going on in Brazil um, and how it's creating influences and leaders in Brazilian society. Uh, the woman that's been doing this on behalf of the Anne Frank House says that these youngsters can really take their lives into their own hands and are changing their own communities. It starts by them getting sensitized to Anne Frank's story, and they reflect on how they see their own future. They connect their needs to what they want for their community. The Anne Frank pioneers are promoting projects in sport, education, and making connections to pioneers groups in other schools through a WhatsApp group. It's giving these young people the confidence to approach the authorities themselves with ideas for improvement. The local departments for education, for agriculture, for sports, and even the police. Another area that the Anne Frank pioneers are tackling is that of climate change. Yoelka told me that this is very much felt in daily life in Brazil, where the winters are getting noticeably shorter and the summers longer and hotter. As one of their first activities, the Anne Frank pioneers are, taking into the woods, are taken into the woods together to engender a feeling of the importance of the natural world. In Anne's writing, too, she describes her wonder at the beauty of nature. So we've come full circle from my first reading to you about Anne's writing and how these young kids in Brazil are really taking it upon themselves to enact their roles as Anne Frank pioneers. And also, um, Argentina. Now, the Anne Frank House has been working for many years in Argentina. And in 2009, 10 years ago, they set up the Centro Anna Frank in Buenos Aires. And as well as sort of recreating uh, part of the Anne Frank House, uh, because, you know, these kids are so far from Amsterdam, there's very, very little chance, really, of them actually getting over to visit the Anne Frank House. So and a wonderful recreation. Uh, they also have an exhibition about the brutal dictatorship in those years of the mid, between the mid-1970s and early 1980s in Brazil, what they called the Dirty War Against Democracy. And it was one of the very first places in uh, Argentina to actually op openly exhibit about those terrible years, and I describe that very much in the book. And very interesting because where it's housed is, is, is a, a villa owned by a family, and they donated it to um, become the Centro Anna Frank. But it's most appropriate because during the Dirty War, they were actually hiding a journalist in that very villa. So it was a house of refuge, a house of hiding in the dirty war in Argentina. So, so great resonances there with uh, the new Centro Anna Frank. Um, I'm going over now to uh, the Indian, to over to uh, the Indian subcontinent, and this is Sri Lanka. Now, Sri Lanka itself had a terrible civil war that went on for 30 years, 30 long years, between the Lankans and the Tamils. And uh, when the war actually finished, 
This was one of the very first projects to go up north to Jaffna in the north, which was out of bounds. I visited Sri Lanka in 1997. You couldn't go to Jaffna in the north because the civil war was raging and also the whole of the east. But this was one of the very, very first projects to go up to um, Jaffna. And you can see these young people again. You've got a, a teenage peer educator there. And they actually used the exhibition to really open up and look um, amongst themselves of their own attitudes between, to, towards each other. And now they, they want to create an exhibition, a similar traveling exhibition about the war and work on it together from the two previous sides in the conflict. And in India also, we've had um, some wonderful pilot programs in Kolkata, for example, and wrote about Gandhi, actually, in her diary. And what would she have thought if she knew an exhibition about her had been going to India? And there it's very interesting because they, um, the kids themselves, again, you'll read about it in the book, they um, used the Anne Frank exhibition to look at the whole issue of the inequalities that are still going on in India of the caste system. It's still a very unequal society. So you can see all these sort of different jobs that the um, exhibition is doing. And that's some of our teenage peer educators in the UK. And as I mentioned to you just now, we in the UK also, we are taking that exhibition into some of the really toughest post-industrial areas in the UK, up in the north of England, the, the former mining towns. I think you call them here like the Rust Belt towns that were industrialized, but very, very neglected now. And we take them up there giving these young people, some of whom are three generations of unemployment, giving them the responsibility of being Anne Frank educators and giving that, them feeling of hope and aspiration. So just to give you an example, um, I'm going to tell you what happened in a school up in a particularly tough area of the north of England that was a mining, uh, a coal mining community, and how uh, people have benefited. Over 1,000 Anne Frank peer educators are trained each year in England and Scotland. And of those, approximately half go on to become Anne Frank ambassadors with further training. And they go out into their community and spread, um, become social activists and spread the word. Now, however, in the same way that learning about Anne Frank creates an emotive connection with the destruction of millions of lives, relaying individual uplifting stories from some of these young people who've benefited from being Anne Frank peer guides demonstrates the method's impact even better than statistics. I've heard many of these directly firsthand from the beneficiaries, as well as from their teachers. The program's been particularly successful in the former industrial towns and mining villages in the northeast of England. Despite it being predominantly a white monocultural area, High unemployment means many pockets are recruiting grounds for extremist organizations. And I think you very much have the same going on here in the US at the moment. When I visited the former mining town of Ferry Hill, the principal of the college explained to me the huge value he placed on having the Anne Frank program. He told me that this was a community where there could be up to three generations of unemployed men in one family. As the last coal mine had closed there in 1968, he saw the Anne Frank program as an insurance policy to help keep the next generation of adults away from extremist politics and had brought the program into the school for four consecutive years. Faye, one of the peer guides who'd become an Anne Frank ambassador was now about to leave school, told me that she was a carer for her sick mother and that this was the best thing that had ever happened to her. A consistent relationship with a school, such as Ferry Hill College, gives us the luxury of a long-term assessment of our theory of change. When we first interviewed Jordan Wilson, as a newly turned teenager and Anne Frank educator, he told us in a prepubescent voice that there was racism in his area. He shrugged his shoulders. 
He didn't know how he could do anything about it. Interviewed again four years later, looking more a muscular adult, he said he felt much more confident to challenge racist remarks when he heard them. Jordan felt a strong responsibility to educate people about what he has learned from working with Anne Frank and that this attitude affects everything he does. He even said, I think Anne Frank would be happy as there are so many people preventing what she went through from happening again. Ferry Hills Town Councillors gave me one of my proudest moments at the Anne Frank Trust when having rather furtively asked one of our educators for a copy of our charity's bright green and black logo, it suddenly appeared for a week prior to local elections in the form of a flag flying prominently above the city hall. The councillors saw the Anne Frank Trust flag as a symbol of defiance against extremist politics. Absolutely. So, I've given you a sort of quick helicopter tour of the world. Uh, I go even further. Um, the book covers Japan, China, um, Central America, Hong Kong, um, all a lot of places around the world, and where Anne Frank fits in with that. But I'm going to end with Anne Frank's words. So, these words come at the end of a very long entry that she wrote on the 15th of July, 1944, after over two years in hiding, explaining how hard it is for young people knowing at any day she could be arrested and killed. And she writes, it's really a wonder I haven't abandoned all my ideals. They seem so absurd and impractical. And yet, when I look up at the sky, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that this cruelty will end and peace and tranquility will return once more. In the meantime, I must hold on to my ideals Perhaps the day will come when I'll be able to realize them. Yours, Anne M. Frank. Three weeks after writing those words, Anne was arrested and began her terrible seven-month journey to her death. She died a horrific death of hunger, illness, and despair just because she was considered different, different and unworthy of the right to live, just for being born Jewish. But hang on, what a boring old world it would be if we were all the same. Anne shows us that an individual life can make a real difference through the millions of people who've read her words and been inspired by them to try to make this world a better place. Our work continues, and we are very proud to be associated with the wonderful mission of the Clinton Foundation. Thank you for listening. So I think questions, yes? Someone's got to be first. Sorry? That's a very good question, actually. It was her father, mostly, uh, because this is a, a wonderful collection of pictures and um, a very unusual collection of pictures. There were so many of them. Now, Otto Frank had a Leica in the 1920s, and he became a passionate amateur photographer. And so his twin passions, when his two daughters were born, became his daughters and, uh, and, and photography. So um, we have this very unusual collection. I mean, even when I was growing up, uh, my father had a box brownie. He didn't take anything like the number of 
uh, pictures that Otto Frank did. And many of them were quite artistic. This particular one was not taken by Otto Frank. This was a trip to a studio, a photographer's studio in Amsterdam. Of course, when the family went into hiding, there were no more pictures taken. We don't have any photographs of, of the hiding. But what happened with the photographs was Otto sent them to his family in Switzerland. And that's how all this incredible collection of photographs survived. So mostly they were taken by Otto. I'm not sure how many you have in the UK, in, in the US. We have about 10 in the state, in, in the UK, yeah. I was curious about that in other countries other than the UK and the United States where there might be other ones. And what is the criteria that you use for the selection process of where they will be placed? In the UK, I, I don't know about um, other countries. And I think there are some around Europe. Um, in, uh, certainly in the UK, we, we planted them, we had 10, and we planted them in, in uh, examples of places that we work closely with. So, for example, we've done a lot of work over the years in prisons, we still do. We go to about 14 or 15 prisons every year. Um, and so we had one in a prison, uh, in a high security prison, one in a, a, a couple in schools that we, we work closely with. Now, I know that the ones in uh, the US have gone to very significant places. So for example, there's one down at the World Trade Center, there's one at the Capitol Hill in, in DC. Um, I know that there are two here, one here at the Clinton Foundation and one, one at the Central High School. Um, and so those are the criteria that they use of really significant places around the US. Um, but we also plant symbolic Anne Frank trees. So they don't have to be actually the saplings. We started it in 1998, uh, to coming up of the millennium, when the tree hadn't actually blown down yet, but it was in danger of. So we wanted to recreate the tree. And, and also out of that came the Anne Frank Declaration, which was part of the tree planting ceremony, which was, plant, was, which was written on my sofa in my home and signed by world leaders, such as Kofi Annan, the United Nations, President Clinton signed up to it, and other world leaders as well. So um, we have sort of slightly different projects as well, but um, we're all absolutely the same mission. Uh, there was a story that circulated pretty widely in the US that um, the Frank, Frank uh, family was actually denied uh, an immigration visa to the US, although yeah. apparently it's not true. Yeah. Is that what your research shows? That, oh, yes. Although he didn't yes, succeed. Yes, he but tried. It, Yes, yeah. I mentioned before about uh, he wrote to the Strauss family that were very influential. They could not do anything for him. Um, it was heartbreaking. Eventually, I mean, he was desperate to get his family out. Eventually, in 1941, he received a visa to go to Cuba. But uh, the Netherlands had already been invaded. He couldn't get out. And it was only for him. He wouldn't have left his family. So yes, it was a des desperate, desperate plight to get out, and he couldn't get, he couldn't get a visa. I have a question regarding the selection of the teenagers. I want to know what is the criteria and what is the commitment after they've been selected. And um, what was the last part of the question? What is the commitment after they've been selected yeah. and trained? What is their commitment yeah. for this work? Yeah, um, it's up to the teachers to select the students. But it's not always the students that one would expect, the naturally gifted, outgoing, communicative students. We found in many schools that the teachers have chosen the students that have communication problems, are shy, perhaps bullied, uh, those that perhaps have come from refugee families and immigrant families to give them some kind of, of boost. And, and so these are the ones that have really benefited most from becoming an Anne Frank educator. And, and we've done a lot of academic research into um, the evaluated how they, these young people have come on and changed. And n not only their attitudes, their understanding about the damage of prejudice and discrimination, but also that they can be 
influencers. They can be leaders. They can be change makers. And uh, they have really benefited, benefited from them. And I mentioned it very fleetingly when I was reading that particularly in the UK, they then, if the school chooses to, they can put the kids forward to go on to further training, which we do twice a year, to they become Anne Frank ambassadors. We call them ambassadors. In Brazil, they call them Anne Frank pioneers, the ones I read about. And um, they come for two days of training, and they learn how to be social activists. And I, I, in fact, it's of benefit to whether they are kids from underserved areas that need their confidence and their ambition and aspiration boost, but also the kids in the private schools as well that are likely to become uh, leaders in our society, they can also certainly benefit by going through Anne Frank programs. Um, partly, part of the reason that I'm working with the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect in New York is they really want to extend and develop their own Anne Frank peer educator programs around the US as well. I'm getting a lot of interest as well. We have time for one more question. How did you yourself get involved with this? What in your background spurred you to do this? I was, a, I was an activist. And um, I was very involved in the 1980s with the campaign to get, getting, trying to get Jews out of Russia. I was very, very involved. And we were actually, where I lived was actually um, a town where we had a lot of conferences. So we were very lucky that we could get to meet Margaret Thatcher, for example, and other po political leaders. So it gave us a great confidence that, hey, we can change the world, we can make things happen. And by the sort of, towards the end, late 1980s, um, that campaign was winding down, because if you remember, Gorbachev was, had come to power and he was opening the doors and letting people out. So I was feeling a bit of bit redundant. And one day I got a call from my very good friend, David Suttendorp, whose father was, had been a friend of Otto Frank. And he called me and said, Gillian, um, I don't know if you've heard, but there's an exhibition about Anne Frank that's come to the UK. And you know my father and um, uh, uh, Otto Frank were friends. Could you help me bring it to our town? And I lived on the south coast. Uh, of, and we formed a committee, and nine months later, the Anne Frank in the World, the first exhibition that I show you, that big one, the black and white one, came to our town, and it wasn't even in the town center, it was in the university, the art college faculty at the university, on the outskirts of town. In three weeks, we had 10,000 visitors. And I thought, and there was obviously a gap in my life because this big campaign I devoted seven years to was winding down. So I, I got on a plane. Uh, people tell me that Chutzpah is my middle name. I got on a plane to Amsterdam, and I went to have a meeting with the director of the Anne Frank House. And I convinced him that they really needed a, a, a British representative of the Anne Frank House to keep this wonderful exhibition on the road. And for my sins, he appointed me the British representative of the Anne Frank House. And I got together with... Um, David, whose father was Otto Frank's friend, and Eva Schloss, you may know that, that name. She was Otto's stepdaughter. Um, her mother married Otto after the war, and Eva was a, um, a, a Holocaust survivor as well, and she was a, a playmate of Anne's in Amsterdam. So Eva and another friend of Otto Frank's, and we formed the Anne Frank Trust in the UK. And it started in my home, and uh, it was myself and a part-time administrator. And when I left three years ago, when I retired, um, we had 35 members of staff that were taking this story really into um, the toughest areas of the UK. I'm very proud of that. And we have regional hubs, uh, people running areas of the UK. And I mentioned before about the prisons. The prisons has been an incredible program. We've been doing that for 17 years now. Um, because the prison governors keep inviting us back. And what we try and do, as well as training some of the prisoners to be our docents, we actually try, if we can, to get a Holocaust survivor 
into a prison to speak to the prisoners. And you can imagine that, you know, these tough, you know, some really high security prisons and a very genteel elderly lady or man, very nicely dressed with a middle European continental accent, um, speaks to them. There's a whole, again, there's a whole chapter all about this in the book and explains what happened to them and that they were in prison, but they were in prison to die. And they tell the um, prisoners to take advantage of every opportunity that they're given in prison for education, for um, apprenticeships, etc. And when they hear it from a Holocaust survivor who they have the greatest respect for, it really gives the, the prisoners a sense of perspective about their own grievances against society. So you can imagine this has been a really, really successful program. We take it into you know, the young offenders institutions as well to try and get them when they're young as well. So um, yeah, and that's how I got involved. <laughs> Well, help me thank Jillian for a wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the Clinton Foundation, thank you so much for being here this evening. This concludes our programmatic portion of the evening. However, there is a book signing directly preceding this to my left, your right. If you have any more questions or you want to pick up the wonderful book, please meet us again behind this stairwell for a book signing and have a safe drive home and thanks for being here again. Have a good one. <laughs>